for tapes of end-time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Saturday morning, August the 16th, 1969. Christ for the Nation Seminar, Dallas, Texas. This tape was with Dr. Derek Prince speaking on the inheritance of the saints in light. This is service eight of nine. Trouble is when I come and listen to the previous preacher, I want to go on preaching what he left off preaching, and that's uh, one of my problems. I'll just point out to you as a matter of interest while I'm sort of clearing the decks here. You find in the first chapter of Romans, Paul prayed that he might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to Rome. And I suppose even Paul was surprised at the way God answered that prayer. So when you pray for prosperity, you get it. But it might not come in exactly the shape that you first anticipated. Exactly the same word that Paul uses in Romans chapter 1 is used in the third epistle of John, the second verse. Beloved, I pray above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. It's the same word that Paul uses when he prays for a prosperous journey by the will of God to Rome. God answered Paul's prayer, but he started as a prisoner. So if you start as a prisoner, don't think you're not going to have a prosperous journey. Just remember it's coming a different way to what you imagine. I believe in prosperity. It's the will of God. But uh, it comes sometimes in unexpected packages. Now, I would have made the statement that I will seek to round off what I was trying to present to you concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and the results of his resurrection. We have dealt with his pre-incarnate eternal nature. And now I want to try to summarize briefly the meaning of his resurrection in relationship to us and what it, we receive through it. Of course, this is the most tremendous subject and you could preach for a week on it without running out of material. I want to just close my outline if I can. I'll give you the scriptures and if you do not have time to turn to them, We'll just have to do our best. We'll begin again at Colossians 1, 18. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. Speaking of Jesus, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Three statements made about him there, changing the order in which they occur in the verse. He is the firstborn from the dead, the beginning of the new creation, the head of all principality and power, and the head over all things to the church. The um, logical order is the reverse of the order given in this text. It's because he's the first begotten from the dead that he becomes the beginning of the new creation, the totally new race, the totally new thing which God planned from eternity to do and fulfilled in the death and resurrection of Christ, and he then receives the position of supreme authority in the universe, the head of all principality and power. These three things go together. Think of them always in this connection. The first begotten from the dead, the beginning of the new order, and the head over all things to the church, which is his body, and the head of all principality and power. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15... Verses 45 and 47, we found these two statements made about Jesus. He is the last Adam, and then he is the second man. The last Adam was made a quickening, life-giving spirit. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And notice, even after death and resurrection, he is still a man. The second man is the Lord from from heaven, and in the first epistle of Timothy, the second chapter and the fifth verse, he is again called a man, even after death and resurrection. There is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. When Jesus Christ, who is God, became man 
at the incarnation, he became man forever. It was not a temporary uh, experiment. It was a permanent change in the very nature of things. And this is why it's called the new creation. He is today the God-man. There is a man at the Father's right hand in the position of all authority and power in the entire universe. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Now, do not misunderstand me. I'm on my guard against being misrepresented. Jesus Christ is divine. He is God. But the new thing is that he is also man. And I could also add this. Jesus as God became man that we as men might become gods. Now this again could sound shocking to you, but it is plainly there in the scripture. If you turn to the second epistle of Peter for one moment, let me show it to you there. The second epistle of Peter, verses 3 and 4 of the first chapter. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Well, I'd better read verse 2 as well. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you, through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, I've pointed out to you already that God has already given us all that we're ever going to need for time and eternity. There's nothing else that has to be added. Total provision has already been made through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And this provision is contained in the promises of God as stated in the fourth verse whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises within the promises of God already given in his word is complete provision for every need that can ever arise in your life for time and eternity no further provision has to be made than has already been made through the promises of God in Jesus Christ through the knowledge of Christ and notice the climax of this fourth verse the first chapter the second epistle of Peter, that by these ye might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That is perfectly clear. The purpose of God in redemption through Christ is that we who believe in him may become partakers of the nature of God himself. This is very clear. Jesus as God became partaker of the nature of man. It says he took not upon him, in Hebrews the second chapter, he took not upon him the, the nature of angels. He did not become a member of the angelic race, but he took upon him the seed of Abraham. He became a member of the Adamic race through the descent of Abraham. He became a member, uh, he became partaker of human nature that we, in return, might become partakers of divine nature. You remember I said that everything that he did on the cross was substitutionary. And in a sense, this is the climax of the entire substitutionary act of redemption. God became man, that man might become God. I, I think it can be stated as simply as that. Now, I'm aware that people could go away from here and misrepresent what I've said, but I think... If you stick to what I've actually said, it is perfectly scriptural. It's astonishing, but then God's plan of redemption is astonishing. In fact, that's just a weak word. I can't think of a stronger word. Now, going back in our thinking to 1 Corinthians 15, 45, 47, Jesus Christ was the last Adam, first of all. And as I pointed out to you, I cannot go into this again, he terminated the evil Adamic inheritance. The entire cascade of evil that was due to the Adamic race because of its sin and rebellion found its complete fulfillment in Jesus Christ on the cross. He exhausted the evil. He exhausted the curse. There was nothing more left and he terminated that evil inheritance. When he said it is finished that was God's great period to Adam and his inheritance. But when he rose from the dead, he was the second man, the second kind of man, the head of a totally new race. And into this race, we enter 
through faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We become members of this new race through our personal faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The first epistle of Peter, chapter 1 and verse 3. First Peter, chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We are begotten again unto a new and living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We, by faith, become identified with him in his death, his burial, and his resurrection from the dead. And also, I would add, though this is not my theme this morning, his ascension. We are seated with him in heavenly places. There is a double identification. Jesus, the sinless one, identified himself with the sinful race that in return the believer might identify himself with Jesus in all that followed the cross, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We are risen with him. We are begotten again. We become the members of a totally new race of which Jesus Christ is the sovereign head. He is the firstborn, the beginning and the head. Now God has stated clearly that he was going to do this and I will mention just a few scriptures. Jeremiah 31, 22, a marvelous verse in my opinion. Jeremiah 31, 22. How long wilt thou go about, O backsliding daughter? The Lord hath created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall compass a man. And the word used in Hebrew for man is a word that is several times used in prophecy to refer to Jesus Christ. Now, I've never been able to find any commentary that explained that verse, but my understanding of it is this is the incarnation. A woman shall compass a man. The Virgin Mary within her womb compassed the divine Son of God. And out of that, there came a new creation. The Lord hath created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall compass a man. And in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Wherefore, if any man be in Christ, a new creation has taken place. That's what Paul says. Much better than he is a new creature. A new creation has taken place. And Revelation 21, 5 says, He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. God is going to replace the first creation by a new creation. The beginning of the new creation is Jesus Christ risen from the dead. And he becomes the head of this new thing. And we, sinners saved by grace, are the first to be identified with him in this new creation. This is the amazing riches of the grace of God that we who were far off have been made nigh. We got the first place in the new thing. We are the first people ever to enter into it. This is stated in Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 10 through 12. We have to read verse 9 as well. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, God's will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, God purposed this good pleasure in himself before creation ever came into being the first time, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, in the completion of all the ages which still lies ahead beyond the millennium, in a period when all God's purposes from all ages come to their complete climax and fulfillment, that's what the dispensation of the fullness of the times means, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. Everything in this new creation is going to be brought to God in Christ. There will be nothing outside of Christ. All things, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, 
even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. We have already obtained it. It is already achieved for us. Being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. You see, we get the, the, the box seats. We get the royalty place in this new creation. We are the first ones in. And that's the praise to the praise of the glory of God's grace. See, God has made known his grace that it will never be forgotten throughout eternal ages in giving us the first place, the least worthy, the furthest away, the most inadequate. This is his grace. Why did he choose you? Because you were wise and clever and good and righteous? No. Just because you weren't any of those things. And you see, the big problem with human beings is to receive the grace of God without trying to think why they deserve it. I believe God rejoices when he can find someone simple enough to receive his grace without trying to explain to people why he deserves it. This is the grace of God that in this new creation, which started with Christ and the resurrection, you and I are going to be identified more closely with Christ than any, anything else in the universe. We are going to be the, have the privilege of first trusting in him. Whenever you think that it's a little bit hard to be a Christian and you feel somewhat lonely and people don't understand you, remember that through all eternal ages you are going to have the supreme honor of being the group that first trusted in Christ. So, hold out. Don't give up. Because you'd regret it bitterly forever, if you ever let slip that unusual privilege which God has bestowed upon you. All right, we can go on in Ephesians to the second chapter, and we can read verse 13, 14, and 15, reminding these Gentile Christians what they had been without hope, without Christ, and without God. He says in the 13th verse, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who once were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man. So making peace. This is the new man. One new man. And at the cross, if you study these verses, you'll see that Jesus achieved a double reconciliation. And the word enmity is used twice. Once it's the enmity between God and the human race. The other time it's the enmity between Jew and Gentile. And both these enmities were resolved at the cross. The vertical relationship between God and man the horizontal relationship between man and man, both were resolved at the cross. There was reconciliation both ways. And out of those divided two, Jew and Gentile, separated by the middle wall of partition, beyond which the Gentiles had no access to God, God brought into being one new man. And remember, it's not a lot of new men. It's one new man. It's a lot of persons. But one man, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And in Ephesians 4, 22, 3 and 4, we are told that we put off in relationship to the former life the old man who is corrupt according to the deceitful lust and that we be renewed in the spirit of our minds and that we put on the new man. So we have to put off the old man, the old Adamic inheritance and in nature, the flesh, the body of sin. And this is an act of the will. It's made possible by what Christ has done, but it's made effective when we will it in faith and do it. We put off the old nature like a dirty suit of stained clothing. 
and we put on the new man, who, it says, after God, in accordance with purposes of God, is created, it's a new creation, in righteousness and holiness of truth. The new man is the product of the truth. He's begotten the gain of the word of truth, which is the gospel. And the word of truth, received into our hearts, begets in us this new nature, which is a nature of righteousness and holiness. This is the new creation. You see, the word truth is very significant, because the old Adamic nature, after the fall, was the product of a lie. Man fell through believing the devil's lie. And the old nature is as crooked as the serpent that begot it. You've never seen a straight snake, have you? You never will. And the old nature is just as crooked as the snake that begot it. It's the product of a lie. It's corrupt. In every area, spiritually, mentally, morally, physically corrupt. Every part of the old inheritance is contaminated. It may appear fine on the outside. There may be much intelligence, much charm. A wonderful personality, but somewhere inside the whole thing is corrupt. And God isn't going to patch it up, reform it, improve it, send it to church, or even put it in the icebox. He's finished with it. Take it, dump it in the garbage, put it off. Don't try and sew a little patch of God's righteousness on the filthy rags of your old garment. See, Jesus said that's what a lot of religious people are trying to do. Patch themselves up. Doesn't work. All that happens is it makes the hole bigger. You know that. This is the new man. Put on the new man. Remember that there's a very important area of responsibility in us. We have to put off. When you get up in the morning, you don't expect your wife to take your pajamas off for you, do you? You do that. You don't expect your wife to dress you unless you're an invalid. You put your clothes on. It's a decision. It's an act of your will. It's the same with this. You put off the old man. You say, get away from me. You don't belong. You have no more place in me. This evil inheritance is terminated. Lying, stealing, cursing, hating, envying, lust, all these things. They don't belong. And then you put on the new man by an act of your will. You couldn't do it. Friend, it's not mind over matter. You couldn't do it if God's word hadn't made it possible. But in the light of God's word, then you act in obedience and it becomes effective. I find the last that the majority of Christians are still expecting the pastor to clothe them. In other words, if somebody doesn't do, you, do it for you, it'll never happen. Well, in that case, it will never happen. You have to do it. Put off the old man, put on the new. And then again in Colossians, the third chapter... And the 10th verse, Colossians 3.10, verse 9, we could do, well, there you are, once you start, you never know where to stop starting. Well, we begin at verse 8 of Colossians 3, but now ye also put off, notice, put off all the anger, wrath, malice. These are not the outward sins of drunkenness and adultery. But they're just as deadly. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication, dirty talk, suggestive jokes out of your mouth. I was talking to a lady the other day and a little boy wouldn't stop saying damn. So she took the good old fashioned remedy. She said, well, before you go to school this morning, I'm going to wash your mouth out. And she washed it out with soapy water and he stopped saying damn. So... Wash your mouth out. Stop letting dirty, smutty, malicious, untrue, gossipy talk come out. It doesn't belong in the new creation. Verse 9, lie not one to another. Seeing you have put off the old man with his deeds. You see, the very mark of the old nature is its crookedness, its deceptiveness. The heart, the old, unregenerate heart, Jeremiah 17, 9, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And verse 10, And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, which is being continually renewed through the knowledge of God until the image or likeness of God is restored in him. 
See, the first creation produced man in the likeness of God. That likeness was marred by sin and the fall, but the second creation restores the likeness of God in man. And you'll notice that in the first creation, God did not rest until he had brought forth his own likeness in the creature. And in the second creation, God will not rest until he has restored his own likeness in the believer. And in this new man, I like to read this too in verse 11, there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Remember, it is never new men, it is always one new man. Now, having made these statements about the new creation, the new man in Christ, the new race, the God-man race, I want to speak, and I wish I had a week to speak about this, about what we're supposed to do about it. My criticism, myself and other preachers, is we usually tell people the, the end result, and we never tell them how to get there. Amen. Time and time again, we, we leave people hanging. Well, isn't it wonderful, but I'm about five miles away from the place where the man tells me I ought to be. How do I cover those intervening five miles? Now, I trust that we won't leave that impression at the end of this seminar. The trouble is, if this seminar was just beginning instead of ending, we'd really get somewhere. Not merely myself, but the other preachers too. I'm sure they feel the same way. We just got moving, and now we have to stop. Won't it be nice when we get the glory and we don't have to turn off? Now, I want to say something in this connection about authority. It's a very important word. And in the Greek language, it has a very definite meaning. The Greek word is exousia. And ex means out of, and usia means being. So it's something which is derived out of somebody else. This is the great secret of authority. Authority is never something you have in yourself. It is something you have in virtue of what you've received from outside you, from another. <clears throat> Here's the secret of having authority, see. Lots of people want authority, but they don't have it. And the Roman centurion, when he came to Jesus, he hit the nail fair and square on the head when he spoke about authority. Because, you remember, he wanted Jesus to come and heal his servant. Jesus said, I'll come. He said, you don't need to come under my roof. Just speak the word and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man under authority. I say to this man, go and he goes. To this man, come and he cometh. To my servant, do this and he doeth it. The centurion recognized spiritual authority. Being a man with authority, he could recognize it. What he had in the military and natural plane, he saw that Jesus had in the spiritual plane. He said, I don't have to shout three times at my soldiers when I want them to do something. I say it once and they jump to it. And he said, all you've got to do is just say it and it will happen. He identified authority, which many of the other people of, of the time of Jesus couldn't identify. But being a man of authority, he immediately recognized authority. But I, what I want you to notice is the way he expressed his authority, because it's quite contrary to natural thinking. He didn't say, I am a man that has authority. He said, I am a man under authority. And you do not have authority unless you are under authority. That is the nature of authority. It's not in you. It's something that you receive from your relationship to another. Now, the Roman centurion had authority because he was under his superior, who was under his superior, who ultimately represented the Roman emperor. And because of what the army calls this chain of command, the centurion represented the emperor. And anybody that resisted the will of the centurion was resisting the will of the great Roman emperor. But he had this not because of what he was in himself, but of his, because of his relationship to the emperor and being in the right position. Being under authority gave him authority. Now today the world is full of people that want authority but don't want to be under authority and the result is they don't have authority. And this is equally true in the spiritual. There is a chain of command and all authority originates in the first instance, only with one person. And you know who that is? God. And wherever we find authority, it originated with God. Now, the divine chain of command in human life is stated very simply. God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of the man. 
and the man is the head of the woman. Now, anybody that gets out of that position has lost authority. See, a woman that is not under her head is a woman without authority. And parents that are not in a right relationship to one another have no authority over their children. See, it, you cannot have authority without being the right link in the right place in the chain. This is one of the tragedies of modern life and modern Christianity. The people are trying to have authority, but they aren't in the right relationship. It's the same in the spiritual realm. If I am doing what God commands me to do, if I'm preaching the message that God gives me, anybody that resists me is resisting God. I don't have to worry about them. I just stand aside and let them deal with God. Now, this is, this is not boasting. It should be true of every believer. If you are doing the thing that God commanded you to do in obedience to God, in obedience to his word, under the direction of his Holy Spirit, then anybody that tries to stop you is trying to stop God. Then let them try. But this is the secret of authority. Now, why I say this is because we are confronted in the fact, with the fact in Scripture that there is authority which is, which is evil. We've already got that in Colossians. Let's look again at it for a moment. In the 13th verse of the first chapter, it says, God has delivered us from the power of darkness. The word power is authority. Now, this teaches us very clearly that darkness has authority. And this is a surprising fact. How could it come about that evil forces can have authority? The answer is simply, and I wish I had about 15 hours to go into this, that all this authority originated with God but has been taken and usurped and misapplied against God. But nevertheless, it originated with God. You see, rebellion against God did not begin on earth. You know that. It began in heaven. And I heard Brother Duncombe saying that there were probably three chief archangels. This is a matter, I think, of opinion rather than doctrine. Michael, I'm, I'm going beyond what he said, but I understood him to be in this line of thinking. Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer. And at a certain point, Lucifer organized rebellion against God. You read the 28th chapter of Ezekiel, and with a correct translation, it is perfectly clear that Lucifer went up and down heaven saying to his fellow angels, now look here, why do you bother to serve God when you could be serving me? Look how beautiful I am. Look how wise I am. See, it says his wisdom was corrupted because of his brightness. You have to read it in the 28th chapter of Ezekiel. We don't have time to turn. The words that are used there indicate a deliberate, planned, organized rebellion against God. The word traffic is used in the King James Version, and the same word is used in the book of Proverbs to go up and down as a talebearer. And it's one of the things that God judges most severely. In Exodus, the 23rd chapter, thou shalt not go up and down amongst thy people as a talebearer. The same word is used, and it's translated traffic in Ezekiel, the 28th chapter, and describes the activity of Lucifer before he fell. He went around organizing rebellion in heaven against God. It's the most astonishing thing, but it's very clearly revealed in Scripture. You'll also find it stated in the 14th chapter of Isaiah, if you want another place. And uh, Lucifer wanted a position of equality with God. He said the final, birth, the final ambition... In the 14th chapter of, the, of Isaiah, there are five statements beginning with, I will, I will, I will, I will. And the last one was, I will be like or equal to the Most High. This was the climax of his rebellion. Now, in Philippians 2, the scripture says that Jesus, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. That is not a very accurate translation. Uh, you find in most of the modern translations, thought that equality with God was not something to be grabbed or grasped. And here is a definite contrast with Lucifer. Jesus, having by his right as God's only begotten Son, perfect equality with the Father, did not have to grasp that. Satan, being a created being, grasped that equality with God, and when he reached up, you know what happened? His slipped. His foot slipped, and he went tumbling down out of heaven. He fell. But when he fell, his rebellion fell with him. 
And apparently one-third of the created angelic beings were on his side and fell with him. But because he had been one of the supreme cherubs, it says he was the anointed cherub that covered in Ezekiel, the 28th chapter, he had authority. And when he fell, he still retained authority because it came from God. And those angels that submitted to him and rebelled against God submitted to his authority permanently. And they're still under his authority. The kingdom of Satan is not divided. There is authority. The will of Satan is affected. He's in control. He has authority. The 12th chapter of Matthew makes this absolutely clear. This authority came from God, but has been usurped and misused and turned against God. But it's still real. There is the authority of darkness. Now, on earth, at a subsequent period, God created Adam, placed him in the beautiful garden that he'd specially prepared for him, and gave him authority. Here is what the majority of Christians totally fail to understand, the tremendous scope of the authority of Adam as he was created. If you look in Genesis 1 and the 26th verse, you will find the astonishing measure of authority that Adam had. Genesis 1, 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them, that is the human race, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth. The human race was to have dominion, God-given government, over all the earth and the fowl of the air as high as the eagle could fly. The whole peripheral atmosphere of the earth was under their domain. And furthermore, they visibly showed forth the likeness of the Creator, so that the whole of the remaining creation, looking at Adam, saw in him the likeness of the Creator and were under his authority. This was God-given. Now, what happened in the third chapter of Genesis was that Satan, who was already the leader of a heavenly rebellion, stirred up an earthly rebellion and persuaded Adam to turn against the one who created him and given him his authority and to side with the devil. And in this way, Adam, like the angels that fell, submitted himself to the authority of Satan and came under the authority of Satan. And listen, not merely did Adam fall as an individual, but his entire area of God-given authority felt the impact of his fall. The earth was cursed. Thorns and thistles came forth. The nature of the beasts was changed. Pain and sickness and sorrow came into the world. And it all came when Adam took the authority that God had given him and transferred it to Satan. So Satan became the ruler of a double rebellion. First of all, he was the ruler of the angelic rebellion in heaven. And he set up a rival kingdom, which is plainly described in many passages of Scripture. Secondly, he usurped uh, Adam's kingdom on earth and became, and three times he is called this by Jesus, the prince of this world, the ruler of this world. Now the authority that Adam had, he had from God, he transferred it to Satan. So that now we understand why the scripture speaks about the realm of the authority of darkness. It's a tremendous realm. It includes one-third of the angels and the entire world and the entire human race are under the power of darkness. All right. What is God's answer? God's answer in the next five or ten minutes is the cross. John 12, 31, 33. As Jesus made ready to go to the cross, knowing full well what lay ahead of him, ahead of him having set his face to fulfill the Father's will, he made these wonderful words, in these wonderful statements in John 12, 31, 32, 33. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, 
signifying what death he should die. It is clear that he was referring to the cross, where he was to be lifted up on the cross. And he said, in relation to this, now is the judgment of this world. Now is the prince of this world cast out. Oh, if we could grasp this truth. Oh, if we could understand it. How much more effective our Christianity would be. On the cross, Jesus terminated Satan's legal authority over the Adamic race. Why? Because he satisfied every claim of divine justice. He made it possible for God to forgive man without compromising his justice and therefore delivered man out of this realm of satanic authority. As I told you last night, up to the time of the cross, God could have intervened in judgment at any moment that he wished on all the forces that were in opposition and rebellion against him. But if ever he intervened in, re in judgment on Satan and his angelic fallen kingdom, Justice would have required that he would have had to intervene in final judgment on the Adamic race as well. He could not spare the one and judge the other without compromising his justice. But on the cross, Jesus, the last Adam, not taking upon himself the nature of angels, making no propitiation for the sin of fallen angels, but as the representative of Adam, made a full and final propitiation for the sin of the entire Adamic race. And by that act, the authority of Satan was terminated. Now is the judgment of this world. Judgment has been meted out on the cross. Now through this act, the prince of this world, Satan, is cast out. Now this is stated very clearly also in Colossians 2, 15. And this again speaks about the cross. Uh, we will just read out... Verses 14 and 15, many of you here last night, and I dealt with them in some measure last night, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us and which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. The law had to be dealt with. The law had to be abrogated and taken out of the way because if we were ever required to live under the law, we would be under condemnation immediately. So this was part of the provision. Forgiveness for past sins had to be provided and then the climax of the whole transaction, he spoiled, he stripped principalities and powers and made an open show of them, triumphing over them in the cross. He stripped Satan of every means that he could legitimately use to dominate the human race because he satisfied every claim of divine justice. And Jesus said elsewhere in the Gospels, When a strong man armed keepeth his goods, his palace is in peace. But when a stronger than he cometh upon him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted, and spoileth his goods. Now the strong man armed that kept his palace was Satan. But the stronger than he that came upon him is Jesus. And listen, when Jesus came upon Satan, he did two things. First of all, he stripped him of all his armor. Secondly, he spoiled his goods. He opened the way for his captives to go free. And this is stated here in Colossians 2.15. He spoiled, he stripped of all their armor, principalities and powers, Satan's whole uh, domain of authority, every realm of it was stripped of its power by the work of the cross and the way was opened for the captives, you and me, to go free. But it will never become effective in our lives until we understand out of scripture the true nature of what has taken place. As long as Satan can keep the church in ignorance, he keeps the church in bondage. And that's the church today. In spite of all that Jesus Christ has done on the cross, we still shiver and shake in fear of Satan's power. And we do not realize that the prison door is open and we can walk out any moment that we de decide. Now, the third and final stage of my argument, and I've got about seven minutes for it, is that the authority which Adam betrayed to Satan, 
and which Satan usurped in heaven, has now been vested in this new man that rose from the dead, Jesus Christ. And in Matthew 28, 18, he came to his disciples after the resurrection and he said, All power, authority is the correct word, has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Because God's justice has now been satisfied, he can revoke the original authority and re distribute it to his son Jesus Christ as a result of the cross before the cross Jesus could not say that but he said all authority has now been given to me and then you know what he said next and this is the climax of what I want to tell you go ye therefore this is what I'm trying to get to and I thank God I've got about six minutes to get to it because Jesus has defeated Satan because all authority has now been given to our risen head, Jesus, what? He's gone back to heaven. And who's got to do it? We have. He's made it possible. We have to make it effective. All authority was given unto me. A most amazing thing to follow. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. You are my representatives. I charge you with my authority. Go forth and demonstrate it. And yet more amazing, really, in a way, is John 20 and verse 21. John 20, 21. I would like to go into the background of this, but I cannot do so. It's a resurrection, the first resurrection appearance of Jesus. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, so send I you. How did the Father send Jesus? Listen, and I'll tell you briefly. Jesus said this. He said, I came not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. He said, the works that I do, the Father that dwelleth in me doeth the works. He said, I do not speak my own words, but the words which the Father gave me. And he said, finally, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. That's how the Father sent Jesus. Now Jesus says, as my Father sent me, so send I you. What does that mean? It means that if you are a Christian, you are obligated to be able to stand in front of the world and say this. I, did not, I am not here to do my own will, but the will of Christ who sent me. The works that I do, I do not do it, but it is Christ in me that doeth the works. The words that I speak, I speak not of myself, but Christ gave them to me. And finally, if you've seen me, you've seen Jesus. That is the obligation of every Christian. This is what it is to be a member of the new creation. This is the purpose of God. It's worked out in us. Now, two final scriptures. Ephesians 6, 12, For we wrestle, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against wicked, spiritual wickedness in high places. I, I prefer my own version. We wrestle against rulerships, against authorities, against the world rulers of the present darkness, against spirits of lawlessness in heavenly places. Notice. We, as Christians, are involved in a conflict. It is not primarily the conflict with demons, which in my opinion are earthbound spirits and are not fallen angels. But this is the conflict in the heavenly realm with Satan and his usurping angelic kingdom. Though he has been defeated by the death of Christ on the cross, the administering of that defeat is our responsibility. This is why we are here. And Revelation 12, 11 sums this up as a picture at the close of this age. And speaking about the saints of God on earth in conflict with Satan, it says, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. In other words, the final defeat of Satan is to be accomplished by the saints of God on earth. On the basis of what Christ has done, he has won the victory, we administer it. 
And if you study the 12th chapter of Revelation, though Michael and his angels are involved, they do not achieve the victory. The victory is achieved by the saints on earth, and they overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And I understand this to mean that as Christians, you and I are responsible to make effective the victory of Christ and to make effective the defeat of Satan. And it will not be achieved until we do it. That's why we're here. And 2 Corinthians 10, 4, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the casting down of strongholds. I believe as Christians we are obligated to change history. I believe as Christians we are obligated to intervene in the affairs of the nations and change the course of national and international affairs. And if we do not do it, we are not doing our job. And personally, I thank God in the past I've had the privilege of doing it by sharing in prayer with my wife and others. I have changed history and I'm still in the history changing business. And I don't mean that I'm some unique and special purpose. I believe I'm doing what every Christian should be doing, changing history. We are the salt of the earth. We're here to change the earth. And if we're not doing it, we're salt that has lost its savor. I believe that we can intervene by prayer in Vietnam and Southeast Asia and change the course of events. I believe if we don't do it, it's our shame. I believe we can change the course of government in the United States or Britain or any nation where we pray in faith according to the word of God and in the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe it's our obligation to do it. Now, if I had precisely one more period, I could devote it to telling you of actual instances in which I know that history has been changed in major respects in this generation by my friends. Now, you can stand there and say... He's conceded. Well, listen, friend, I'll just ask you this. Do you believe that God answers prayer? Well, wait a minute. You say amen. That's wonderful. But what are you doing about it? Do you expect things to happen when you pray? Do you know the first item on the Christian's prayer list? For all that are in authority. Do you pray that way? No, you don't. Some of you, I can see you've never heard of it in your life before. Your first obligation in prayer is for the government. And if you're not doing it, you're failing in your responsibility. And the nature of the government depends on the prayers of God's people. God's people get a government as good as they deserve. <laughs> Behold, I send thee forth, and thou shalt go as I direct thee. Thou shalt not turn to the right hand nor to the left, for I have made thy feet swift feet. Yea, thy feet shall be like hinds feet, and thou shalt tread upon thy high places, and thou shalt go from strength to strength, and from glory to glory, and from power to power, and from victory to victory. Turn not back, neither be deflected, turn not to the right hand, nor to the left hand. Let thine eyes look straight forward, and let thine eyelids look right on. Make straight paths for thy feet, turn not aside, lest that which is lame be turned aside after thee, but rather make straight paths for thy feet, that that which is lame may be healed, for the Lord thy God hath commissioned thee and charged thee this day. He hath called thee to a service, he hath called thee to a warfare, he hath shown thee the armory, he hath shown thee the place of equipment, he hath shown thee the place of endowment, and thou art answerable and thou art chargeable before the Lord God, before the Lord Jesus Christ, and before the elect angels before whom thou shalt stand, and give an account of thy service and thy soldiership. Therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, seek not to please the world, seek not the way of ease, nor the way of popularity, 
but war a good warfare in the power of the might of Almighty God who shall endue thee with much greater strength with much more authority, with much greater wisdom and understanding than thou hast yet begun to perceive. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Amen. Let's stand to our feet and praise God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's dedicate ourselves to the fulfillment of the charge which the Lord has given us this morning. Without any special dramatic kind of service as we stand here and worship God, let's dedicate ourselves to the fulfillment of the task for which the Lord called us together in this seminar. I'm going to ask uh, any brother that feels so prompted just to commit us to the Lord at the end of this session now. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.